God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Last Saturday, I was sitting on my back porch, and it was, it was like maybe about 11 o'clock. And the neighbors behind me, we sort of, um, there's a hill behind my house, and, and it's very a treed hill, and so I don't really know them yet. I've just really moved there. But I could hear them. They were having a party. And at 11 o'clock, the music started. <laughs> and I, I felt like I was at the party. And so there was all this, these, um, these songs that I knew from the radio, but I didn't know their name or who sang them. So I thought, well, I'm in that phase of my life that, you know, I just don't know popular culture anymore like maybe I used to. But then all of a sudden the music stopped and I was like, oh. But then it started again. And through the woods and down the hill came the voice of Andy Williams. Remember that song, More? Remember that? Now, you have to be like over 50 to understand who Andy Williams is, I, I guess. But, but I went from being annoyed to being absolutely transported to my parents' living room in Valley Stream 60 years ago. And I have this very clear memory of them dancing to that song. And I thought about my mom and dad, and I thought about our home there, and I thought about um, my younger brother and sister, who have both passed. And I felt sort of a sadness and a nostalgia, but I also felt a sense of belonging. I remember that I belonged to a family. All of that was poured by me into a song. That has nothing really to do with me. But songs and hymns are vessels for meaning. We pour meaning into them. And they change our lives. That moment was a wonderful moment. And then it went back to being annoying. But that moment, <laughs> it was a gift to remember my parents and my siblings, and to remember that I belong. Music does that. We're told that on one of the last, well, on the last night of Jesus' life, one of the last things he did before he got up from table was to sing a hymn. And probably, the scholars tell us that the hymn that he sang with his disciples was Psalm 118. It's a song about belonging. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And I belong in the steadfast love of the Lord. Think about that. Think about on the night before he died, all the meaning that would have been poured into that song, all of the Passovers before, the three-year journey, the family he grew up with, his family, his family and God, the ministry before him, all poured into that. And think about the people who were there. They probably never heard that psalm in the same way. In fact, we're still meditating on that psalm today. It's a central part of our worship for Holy Week, both on Palm Sunday and Easter. The steadfast love of the Lord, that arc of the journey of Holy Week, is all about remembering and being a part of something. Caught up in remembering. Caught up in identity. The psalm we heard today, Jesus would also have sung and known very well. It's a well-known, well-loved psalm. In its roots that Jesus would have sung it, he probably would have sung it, it's about entering into the temple, it's about leaving the secular world and entering into the space of the holy. And people literally did that. It was a processional psalm that people moved 
from outside the temple, through the gate of the temple, into the courts of the temple itself, where God was present in a very particular way. An individual could sing that themselves. They could move through that whole journey. To get into the temple of Jerusalem, you climbed up these very broad steps, these white, white steps in the Middle Eastern sun, and you entered into a tunnel and walked up more steps, and then you walked up to the platform where the temple was itself. And so you went from light to dark to light again, almost a hypnotic way of entering into the space of the holy. Think of yourself. How many of you pro parked on Prospect Street today? I always park there. It's the only place you get a spot. But think of yourself getting out of your car and singing that hymn as you entered into this place where God is home in a particular way. Think about that. It's a wonderful psalm, but at its heart, there's a challenging question. We are his because he has made us. We are his because he has made us. In a culture of the late, well, early 21st century, I, this sense of um, we are self-actualized people. We, are, we exalt in sort of the radical individualism. We are his. Who has sovereignty over your life? Is it you or is it God? We are his because he made us. He made us. And that making is not just the created order, but it's the whole arc of salvation history. God made a people. God bonded individuals into a group. God made a people in the Exodus. God made a people in the covenant of Abraham. God made a people as, a, as a Israel journeyed into the promised land. God made a people in the coming of Jesus. We are his because he made us. And in that remembering, in that coming together as a people, We are just not ourselves. We don't have sovereignty only of our own life, but we belong together. It's just, just me, it's us. Now that's some of the countercultural stuff I was talking about last week. You are a community of faith. You are responsible to and for each other. What a joyful gift, but also a challenge. Also a challenge. And when we sing these hymns, we or meeting into them. The Diocese of Long Island, and in fact, uh, finally the country, has been celebrating Juneteenth. And if you don't know what Juneteenth is, it's the, the idea of Juneteenth is, is risen in people's, the general population's ideas, but it's uh, understanding, but it's not new. Juneteenth, is a marker, a celebration, a meaning of the day when slavery in this country was literally and figuratively wrestled out of the hands of the last people who fought for it. Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the news finally got to Texas and people were freed. Two and a half years. This marker of Juneteenth is something that people pour meaning into. It's important. It's foundational. It's part of being a community. We're not our own. We are with each other. And someone we come alongside someone in the important things in their life. And so today we'll be singing some hymns that are really central to Juneteenth. And one of the hymns is the great hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. I can't overestimate the importance of that hymn for African Americans. It is 
a vessel that has been, so much has been poured into. So much has been poured into. Its meaning, its identity, its loss, its pain, its hope. But at its core, it's about belonging to God. Again and again, it talks about no matter what has happened to us, you have led us. No matter what we've been through, God is intimately involved in it. It was written not long after, in the scope of things after the original Juneteenth date, 1890. And by 1920, that's not a long time, by 1920, it was proclaimed the national anthem for African Americans. So important is that hymn. We'll probably change our custom, well, not probably, but we will. When we sing that today, we'll stand out of respect. The third verse of that hymn is a prayer. And it's about, once again, it's about belonging. In the face of everything, we belong to God in the face of everything. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who hast brought us thus far on our way, thou who hast by thy mighty might led us into thy light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we meet thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. So much poured out, hope, despair, praise, into a hymn that celebrates the presence of God and belonging to God for all people. Almighty God, you rescued your people from the slavery in Egypt, and throughout the ages you have never failed to hear the cries of the captives. We remember before you our sisters and brothers in Galveston, Texas, who on this day received the glad tidings of their emancipation. Forgive us for the many grave sins that delayed that liberating word. Anoint us with your spirit to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim the release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.